Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the September Conservative Women's Network. I'm Michelle Easton, president of the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women. This year marks, marks an important anniversary for the Luce Center. We've been preparing and promoting conservative women leaders, like today's speaker, for 30 years now. We do this at events all across the U.S. For example, we have an upcoming student conference, the Western Women's Summit in California in October. We have conservative women giving campus lectures all over the country, like the one our speaker did uh, when she was a student at Georgetown. We have internships, other campus programs, social media blogs, and lunches like this. This month, the Conservative Women's Network is in its tw 23rd year this year, bringing women from all over DC, Virginia, and Maryland to hear the best women speakers discuss key issues. So now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Amber Athey, to discuss her new book, The Snowflakes Revolt, How Woke Millennials Hijacked American Media. Amber will tell us how left-wing activists are destroying the media. The Snowflakes result, Revolt exposes how the left uses campus, campus mob intimidation tactics and the media to force students to comply and agree with their ideas. Her book is part memoir, part investigation, and she suggests ways to respond to the left's tactics. Amber powerfully details her own experience facing leftist backlash in school and throughout her career. She first faced pushback as a conservative, as a Georgetown University student, and she got tired of it, especially the radical feminist ideas promoted at her school. So she organized a lecture with us, this was 2015, uh, at Georgetown with Christina Huff Summers, one of our speakers back then. What I remember most about it, Amber, was the flyers that the loony Georgetown administrators put around the school offering safe spaces. <laughs> Rooms near the lecture with food and common activities for students who were too upset by the speaker's critique of radical feminism. And her activism continued after she graduated from Georgetown. She had a double major in government and economics. She worked as a campus reform investigative reporter reporting on liberal bias and abuse on college campuses. She also worked covering media and breaking news for the Daily Caller. She was their White House correspondent. And now she's a professional journalist and political commentator and is the Washington editor for The Spectator. She hosts a Sunday night radio show at WCBM, that's in Baltimore, and is a senior Blankley Fellow with the Steamboat Institute in Colorado. Her work has been cited by many outlets, Fox News, The Hill, The Daily Mail, The Washington Post, and more. And she's been a guest on many uh, TV programs on Fox News, One America, News Network, and Newsmax many times. She's one of our favorite speakers, and she's given great speeches for the Luce Center, both on campus and at our conferences and seminars. She's passionate about helping young women become bolder conservatives who think for themselves and who speak up at their leftist schools. She lives in Northern Virginia. She's going to be married in three weeks. Congratulations. <laughs> And following today's talk and uh, questions and answers, I hope you join us outside for lunch. And we're going to be selling the book for those of you who like it. And Amber will inscribe it if you, if you like. So please join me now in welcoming Amber Athey. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. You know, every time I hear um, my bio, I think about this part where I say, you know, my work's been cited by all of these outlets, and some of them are outlets we don't like, right? They're very liberal outlets, and I wonder, should I take that out? Does that give the wrong impression? But then I think, you know what, if my work is good enough that even the Washington Post has to cite it, then I don't know. I think that speaks pretty well to what I'm doing. So you kind of have to force them to, to accept the truth sometimes. Um, this book uh, is such a passion project for me. It's the first book I ever wrote. Um, it was during a very difficult personal time in my life, and then I went back and relived all of these crazy campus experiences, um, and, and it was a really rewarding experience, I, I would say. Um, 
And I think it speaks really to the importance of what's happening on our college campuses. Because for a long time, people on the left and even some people on the right really believed that what was happening on campus would stay there. That what the crazy kids were doing was just a phase or a symptom of being on a, on a liberal college campus. And it really wouldn't have any broader effects on society. And we see now that that is obviously not the case. Um, a perfect case study of this is what's been happening with Bud Light. It's been about six months since consumers launched their boycott against Bud Light. And the beer company, of course, came under fire after it decided that they were going to partner with a transgender TikToker by the name of Dylan Mulvaney, who is a man pretending to be a woman. Um, and they had all of these... Uh, Advertisements go up on Dylan Mulvaney's Instagram page where he was basically dressed as the male version of Audrey Hepburn in a black tea dress and white opera gloves, uh, drinking a Bud Light can. And even ahead of the Bud Light partnership, um, Dylan Mulvaney was taking a lot of flack because of his Days of Girlhood TikTok series. This was a series of videos where on a daily basis, Dylan Mulvaney would post you know, day one of girlhood and explain what he was going through on that day. It was uh, supposed to be a depiction of his journey accepting his true gender identity. Um, instead, what happened is he was engaging in tired and cartoonish stereotypes of young women. In fact, on day one, Dylan Mulvaney insisted that he cried several times for no apparent reason um, of course, playing into the trope that women are hysterical and incapable of controlling their emotions um, and crazy. In other videos, Dylan Mulvaney, who again is a grown man, describes planning the perfect girls' night slumber party complete with PJs and popcorn and candy, purports to be addicted to shopping and dresses, has an intense fear of bugs, Frolics through meadows. I'm not kidding. There is actually a video of Dylan Mulvaney frolicking through a meadow, and in the caption, he uses the term frolicking, goes hiking in high heels, and is obsessed with Britney Spears. And despite all of this mockery of womanhood um, by insisting that our behavior, not our biology, is what makes us women, Mulvaney has been celebrated by the corporate media and by corporate America. Less than one year into pretending to be a girl, Dylan Mulvaney was invited to join a podcast with Ulta Beauty alongside another man where they discussed girl issues. Riddle me that. <laughs> Mulvaney, who cannot produce eggs, doesn't have a uterus, or any of the female rep reproductive parts necessary to be a mother insisted on this podcast that he can't wait to be a mother someday. He was also invited to speak on a panel last year at the Forbes Power Women's Summit. Women's Summit. He has done ad partnerships with the popular hair care, care brand K18, Maybelline, KitchenAid. Luckily, my stand mixer was passed down from my grandma, so I don't have to get rid of mine. I didn't buy it after the Dylan Mulvaney partnership. <laughs> Uh, Charlotte Tilbury, Milk Makeup, and Crest. So um, get your white strip somewhere else, ladies. <laughs> this month, Mulvaney is actually gracing the cover of New York Magazine's style imprint, The Cut, but maybe graces is not quite the right word. Bud Light drinkers would probably be forgiven for thinking that this nonsense would never infect their beloved beer brand. They might have thought that it would be untainted by the walking minstrel show that is Dylan Mulvaney. After all, throughout its history, Bud Light made its bones advertising to blue-collar workers, sports fans, patriotic Americans, and dads. Then came, of course, the fateful ad, as mentioned on Mulvaney's Instagram, that showed him sipping from a personalized can while dressed up like Audrey Hepburn. A deranged version, but... That was the goal, to look like Audrey Hepburn. Uh, how did this happen? How did this left-wing, transgender craziness come to a beloved American brand? Well, the culprit soon became clear. Budweiser's vice president of marketing, Alyssa Heinerscheid, 
Heinerscheid, I don't know, I'm not sure how you say it, to be honest, but we'll go with Heinerscheid, said uh, the following on a podcast prior to the Mulvaney partnership. I'm a businesswoman. I had a really clear job to do when I took over Bud Light, and it was, this brand is in decline. It's been in decline for a really long time. And if we do not attract young drinkers to come and drink this brand, there will be no future for Bud Light. She also said, we had this hangover. I mean, Bud Light had been kind of a fratty, out-of-touch humor, and it was really important that we had another approach. Never mind that Heinerscheid herself was participating in some pretty fratty behavior when she was at Harvard, according to some photos from 2006, but do as I say and not as I do, right? If you work in a company yourself, you've probably encountered a lot of people like her. They're usually in your HR departments, your middle management, or your diversity office. They like to create problems where they don't exist, levy false accusations, and then rush in as the savior who's going to fix everything. When they get together in a group, watch out. They are excellent at putting pressure on those who do not comply with their demands. People like Heinerschei don't just exist in corporate America, though. They're in Hollywood, academia, politics, and as I write in my book, The Snowflakes Revolt, they're, of course, in the media. You probably know them more commonly as the woke left. They are the most important reminder that what happens on campus, what young adults are taught, how they behave, and perhaps even more importantly, what they're allowed to get away with really, really matters. Most people in this room would probably agree that the media has been pretty liberal for quite some time, but something seemed to have changed in the past 10 years or so, 10 to 20 years, that really warped the news into just pure left-wing propaganda. And I think to understand how the media got this way, um, its massive shift to the left, and how it got filled with people like that Bud Light marketing VP, we have to go all the way back to the mid-1800s. Stay with me. In the early days of the American Republic, the media industry was not objective or non-biased. That was never the goal. In fact, um, in, the, in the early days of the American Republic, the media existed to be an extension of political parties. It was necessarily biased. That was actually its function. Of course, the media was also filled with working class individuals. It was very much a trade job as opposed to a profession um, in the way that we view it today. It wasn't until the early 1900s that this idea that journalists should be objective and unbiased came into play. And this was something that was born from the intellectual thinkers of the time. And I think, you know, their idea was, was sound. It was a good idea. But the way it was put into practice actually ended up having the opposite effect of what they intended. Um, these intellectuals posited that reporters needed to adhere to a similar version of the scientific method in order to report the news accurately. But to prove that reporters were capable of doing that, they decided that they needed to go to college to get a degree or they needed to go to a dedicated journalism school. As these major news outlets increasingly hired reporters out of these top tier elite universities their newsrooms became echo chambers filled with the liberal elite who were stunningly out of touch with the average American. According to a 2014 Indiana University survey, 92% of journalists had a college degree compared to about 30% of the overall country. It's actually one of the highest rates for any profession in terms of people in it who have a college degree. It's pretty astounding. The Journal of Expertise found that nearly half of New York Times writers and editors attended elite universities, so, you know, top 25. That basically puts them on par with Supreme Court justices and United States senators. And again, they're journalists, not so something that I would consider intellectually on the same level, despite being one as a Supreme Court justice. Certainly not requiring the same level of education, right? Probably more useful to have on-the-job training. Journalists are also far more likely to come from white-collar, wealthy, and well-connected families, partially because the starting salary is so low. And they're more likely to live in cities, and they're less religious than the average American. So it's 
no wonder that the media is so liberal. They're filled with, you know, they're in a newsroom that's filled with people who, who think and come from the same backgrounds as them. The problem really only got worse in 2015 with the rise of Donald Trump when all pretenses of objectivity were dropped in favor of stopping the bad orange man. Journalists decided that standards, traditional standards at this point of journalism were no longer useful. Instead, their job was now to hold power to account and be a voice for the voiceless. In practice, that meant holding conservatives and Republicans accountable and being the voice for the Democratic establishment, as well as their interest groups that vote for them uh, religiously. And in order to accomplish this goal, of course, what did they do? They hired, yet again, more woke activists from the left-wing elite universities. On its face, it doesn't seem like a huge deal that industries like the media are hiring people who went to Harvard or Yale um, got a gender studies degree or an English major, and interned for Greenpeace. But if you are paying attention at all to what's been going on on college campuses in the past decade, you know how destructive these people really can be. It was obvious to a lot of us when they were tossing Molotov cocktails because Ben Shapiro dared to step foot on campus at UC Berkeley. Conservatives sounded the alarm bells on what was happening on campus. Uh, but the media was too busy mocking their concerns as unfounded hysteria. And even some people on the right, to be fair, didn't fully get it. Again, they were convinced that the snowflakes, you know, the special snowflakes as we refer, refer to them because they believe that they uh, can do no wrong and their parents told them, you can be whatever you want to be. Uh, they thought these people would melt once they were exposed to the real world. The real world would slap them in the face. Everything would go back to normal. They would moderate. It all be fine. That obviously did not happen. Why? Well, as Michelle mentioned, I was in George at Georgetown in 2015, and I saw firsthand uh, the threat that these people really pose to society and why they're not going away anytime soon. I'll tell you a few stories from my time on campus to illustrate the point. Student government at Georgetown is a huge, huge deal. Uh, this. College is filled with people who all think they're going to be president one day. Um, they're very narcissistic, a little deranged, if you ask me. But alas, that is a, that's sort of the student population there. They pour everything into their student government campaign, campaigns. I mean, this was a four-month affair on campus. Everybody was obsessed with following all of the polling and the speeches, and people would go to the debates. It was crazy. And to be fair, uh, Bill Clinton... Obviously, former president got his start as a member of the student government at Georgetown. Uh, Condé Nast, another prominent alumni who was in student government. Oklahoma Governor Frank Keating um, and other notable alumni were all involved in that. Um, but during the 2015 student body president election, there was more drama than I think anyone anticipated. Uh, there was one ticket filled with a guy named Christopher Wadibia and Meredith Cheney. Um, Chris is a black guy. Meredith is a white woman. And they kind of thought that they were going to coast into the presidency and the vice presidency. They were supposed to be next in line. But instead, what happened is a satirical ticket made up by two campus comedians decided to throw their hats into the ring and mock the entire Georgetown student government process. They said, this whole thing is ridiculous. All of the things that you're claiming to get done are impossible, so let's just have fun with it. Well, lo and behold, not only did they end up wiping the floor with the Christopher and Meredith ticket on the debate stage, but they actually won the election. It was wild. I know it doesn't sound as cool now, but we were all very excited. <laughs> um, after the, the Christopher and Meredith uh, campaign went down in flames, one of the student newspapers, the Georgetown Voice, published a cartoon that was basically mocking its downfall. It was by a young man by the name of Dylan uh, Cutler, who was actually quite liberal himself. And uh, the cartoon was titled Beating the Dead Horse. And it showed the winning satirical campaign clubbing a dead Meredith and Christopher um, who were inside of a horse costume. Pretty funny, right? You know, innocuous play on an old idiom, um, or so I thought. But according to the Georgetown activist class, this was racist and sexist. They claimed it was racist because it depicted violence against Chris Wadibia, who was a black man, 
And the cartoon was also sexist because Meredith Cheney was in the back of the horse, the rear of the horse, because she was the number two on the ticket, but they said it was because she was a woman. This is a quote from the Black Leadership Forum at Georgetown. The white patriarchal message this image sends is insensitive and incredibly racist, given the history of black men and women being lynched and beaten at the hands of white people in this nation's past and present. It is also concerning that a woman is being depicted as the ass of the horse, reminiscent of, I know it's really funny, <laughs> reminiscent of the misogynistic and socially inferior treatment women have suffered for centuries. The Georgetown Voice caved, they published an apology on their Facebook page, and they removed the cartoon. But it didn't stop there. Student activists decided that they were going to hold a town hall so that all of the Georgetown students could come and air their grievances about how affected they were by this cartoon. The cartoonist himself came to the town hall, and after everyone else had spoken, he went up to the podium and he was ready to burst into tears. I mean, this guy had been through it. And he said, I made a mistake. My privilege is that I have the ability to look past the possible damage that that image could cause. And I'm sorry. I stand with you. I want to help silence the message of hate. Now, it'd be easy to make fun of this guy groveling to his peers, you know. But I actually feel bad for him. This is a guy who is ostensibly on their side. He's published every previous cartoon on the Georgetown Voice was promoting liberal causes. And they turned on him like that to make a point. And it wasn't really about the cartoon. It wasn't really about Dylan Cutler. Because what these activists did next was they used this entire incident to lobby the administration for a diversity requirement that would make sure every student who goes through Georgetown has to take two classes with politically charged themes of diversity or equity in order to graduate. And the administration, seeing how they roasted this young man in front of the entire campus, said, please don't do that to us. We'll do whatever you say. The campus left actually admitted that they were using these public shaming tactics in order to get their way on any number of issues. A young woman by the name of Aya waller Bay, who was one of the leaders of the campus diversity requirement movement, told the Washington Post, hey, this public shaming thing works. Not long after this incident with the Beating the Dead Horse cartoon, I became the number one target of this same mob. And that was because of the event that I hosted as uh, chair of the College Republicans, along with the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women, bringing Dr. Christina Hoff Summers to campus. She was coming to talk about feminism, but somehow the campus left decided that this was all about her denying sexual assault survivors and being a rape apologist. Um, almost immediately upon announcing the event, there were uh, pl protest plans, there were safe spaces uh, erected for her appearance. Georgetown's sexual assault peer education program sent an email out to its members warning that an extremist, anti-feminist speaker that dismisses and denies survivors of sexual assault was coming to campus, and they said that the event needed a trigger warning. Uh, me and my friends were subject to basically an entire week and a half of just horrible online vitriol and abuse. We were uh, brought into the uh, student activities administrator at one point because she was concerned for our safety, but also because some students had complained to the administration that we were making an unsafe environment for them. I don't know how that works. Um, but luckily for us, uh, the event mostly went off without a hitch. We had security there. There was a pretty strict reading of Georgetown's free speech code ahead of the event that warned anyone who tried to speak up that they, or tried to shout over the speaker rather, that they would be removed from the event. So they all stood in the back of the room with their posters that said all kinds of nasty things about us and Dr. Summers, um, and then saved their, most of their fire for after the event. In fact, the Hoya, which is the largest student newspaper on campus, decided to publish an, a piece from the editorial board called No More Distractions, 
It chastised us for bringing Dr. Hoff Summers to campus. It said that we as college Republicans and Claire Booth Luce had knowingly endorsed a harmful conversation and impeded the progress of the university's commitment to providing increased resources to sexual assault survivors. The op-ed continued, It is necessary and valuable to promote the free expression of a plurality of views, but this back and forth about whether or not certain sexual assault statistics are valid is not the conversation that students should be having. Students should engage in a dialogue that focuses on establishing a safe space for survivors while at the same time tackling the root causes of sexual assault. Um, I don't know if you caught the double think in that statement, but they, st they, they start with free expression is important and then immediately say that some conversations are not worth having. A member of the administration actually got involved in the silencing and cancellation attempts not long after they reached out to me and Claire Booth Luce and demanded that they take down a video of the event. It was a public event, open to the public, and they said, you have to take this down off of YouTube because of our very vague and bizarre video policy on campus. Um, it was ridiculous. It's quite clear to me that they only wanted the video taken down because it made their students look like idiots. And uh, to Claire Booth Luce's credit, obviously, they uh, said, heck no, we're not doing that. Go pound sand. And the video stayed up. I think after seeing, um, again, what these students were willing to do to their campus peers, it's not all that surprising that administrators would want to go along with their demands um, because it's important to, to look at these campus administrators and realize most of them are quite cowardly. Um, they've never actually had to stand up for anything in their lives. And so the idea of taking the abuse of being called a racist or a homophobic person or a misogynist is not worth it to them. They'd rather just go with the flow and let the, you know, the inmates run the asylum. Um, but these, these mobsters, again, are, are the people who are graduating from the top universities in our country. And these are people who are easily offended they're often offended on other people's behalf. They are hypocritical, reflexively antagonistic to tradition. They are against a culture of free expression. And they're arrogant enough to think that not only do they have a monopoly on truth, but that they get to le lecture everybody else about what is acceptable in society. They use their perceived victimhood as a means of obtaining and wielding power against others. Communism 101. They claim that our major institutions, academia, Hollywood, corporations, politics, and the media, and America itself even, is sexist, racist, homophobic, and transphobic. They infect all of these institutions, and they insist that they must be put in charge to fix what's wrong and to make up for past transgressions. Then they run them all into the ground. What does it look like when these people take over the media? How does the media react? What kinds of things are they pushing now that they've been filled with the woke campus left? I think a perfect case study is Politico. Raise your hand if you've heard of Politico or ever read it. I think everybody. Anyone who has lived or worked in the D.C. area knows that Politico's Playbook newsletter for decades, since it was launched, I think in the early 2000s, was required reading every single morning before you went to work. And Politico used to be considered one of the actually less biased sources of information, if you can believe it, in the area. Now, it's kind of a low bar, but, but that's uh, how people viewed them. In fact, people on the left would often criticize them for being too friendly to Republicans. That is not the case any longer. As Politico grew in size, newsroom leaders, um, and this is according to people I talked to who have worked at Politico or still work there, they started hiring staffers who had no experience in reporting and instead had spent their college years engaging in left-wing activism. They had no interest in hiding their progressive politics. Instead, they wanted to use the media as a megaphone for their preferred policies. They first threw a tantrum a few years ago when Ben Shapiro was allowed to be a guest author of the Playbook newsletter. They began efforts to unionize. They supported the hiring of diversity, equity, and inclusion officers. 
and they demanded that newsroom leaders implement new reporting standards as well as style guides that advance their ideology and hid the truth. Newsroom leaders were apparently aware that they were now outmanned and outgunned, and so they decided to go along with this, just like the administrators have done on campuses around the country. In March of 2021, a reporter by the name of Gabby Orr, um, a friend of mine, became the target for this new mob. She has always been an objective, fair reporter. Um, I don't think you could ask pretty much anybody who has covered Congress about Gabby, and they would tell you that she is incredibly fair, uh, incredibly talented. She no longer works in, in media, but she still works in politics, I think partially because of this issue. She wrote an article uh, in March of 2021 titled GOP Seizes on Women's Sports as Unlikely Wedge Issue. The article was basically intended to show how Republicans intended to position themselves as the protector, protectors of women's sports and women's bathrooms and locker rooms ahead of the 2022 midterms. Gabby Orr was informed after the publication of this article by Politico's Director of Editorial Diversity Initiatives, Robin Turner, that two colleagues had concerns about the article. Now, first, let me just point out the ridiculousness of having a director of editorial diversity initiatives at any newspaper. I don't know what that position does. I don't know the point of it. The only person who should be involved in editorial decisions are people who are interested in seeking the truth and informing readers. But nonetheless, Gabby was called into a struggle session with the two employees who had complained. It sounds very similar to what's going on in the universities, doesn't it? It's kind of crazy. So she was called into a struggle session. She was interrogated about the fact that she used to work for the Washington Examiner, which is a center-right outlet, and she was asked why the story did not include any statements from transgender people, even though she had extensively quoted a member of an LGBTQ activist organization, the Human Rights Campaign. But because the executive at the Human Rights Campaign wasn't transgender, it didn't count. Her colleagues also complained that she quoted conservatives, such as American Principles Project Director Terry Schilling and former White House Policy Advisor Stephen Miller, without contextualizing their comments as transphobic. She was supposed to explicitly write in there, by the way, what they told me is transphobic, so that readers would understand. Uh, Stephen Miller, but and I'm going to read you some of what they said because their comments are not transphobic, obviously. Um, their comments are accurate, but uh, nonetheless, Stephen Miller was quoted as saying that he believed that the issue of transgender athletes in women's sports would help Republicans win the midterms because the left's position would alienate non-ideological voters. And Terry Schilling sort of pessimistically and satirically praised transgender activists for leading people to believe that there was a wave of violence or a genocide against transgender people, even though, as he pointed out, it's... Uh, quote, like 40 people a year <laughs> who uh, are apparently killed and not even for being transgender, but just happen to be transgender and are murdered. Um, a lot of them work in, uh, in very dangerous industries like sex trafficking. So there's uh, obviously a different explanation for what's going on there. But I, trans I uh, digress. Transgress. <laughs> Um, Gabby, her colleagues argued, again, should have explicitly told readers that those comments were offensive and transphobic. One meeting attendee even took issue with the phrase biological woman appearing in the piece. Gabby had not even used the term herself. It was in one of those aforementioned quotes, um, but that still presented an issue for her woke colleagues. At the conclusion of the meeting, the director of editorial diversity, diversity initiatives Robin Turner suggested that these colleagues get to serve as sensitivity readers for all future articles that Gabby would write about transgender issues. Not long after this incident, Politico decided to take everything a step further. They actually invited three transgender activists to come into the newsroom and lecture all of the reporters about how they were allowed to write about transgender issues. The panelists told reporters that what they considered to be the neutral position on transgenderism was probably created by white cisgender men and thus cannot be trusted to be accurate. Gendered words, they said, are rooted in exclusion and can actually cause trauma 
for transgender and non-gender conforming individuals. A former Politico reporter that I talked to who attended this seminar told me that one of the panelists even complained that the term mother could be offensive to transgender people. Some of the other panelists mocked reporters who had a difficult time grappling with the grammatical implications of referring to a singular person as they, them. The panelists also warned journalists that they cannot simply cover both sides of the transgender issue, which is what you should be charged to do as a journalist, because doing so would involve elevating transphobic voices, aka if you don't agree with what we say, then you're a bigot. The meeting was followed up a few months later with a new style guide that banned reporters from using any gendered language just like these transgender activists had suggested. The style guide prohibited the use of words like mankind, man-made, man-hunt, waiter or waitress, biological gender, biological sex, biological woman, biological female, biological man, or biological male. They really covered the gamut there. When describing abortion issues, reporters were told that they should consider gender-neutral language like people who seek abortions or patients who seek abortions rather than women who seek abortions. Reporters were also told to use gender-neutral language like pregnant people or people using birth control rather than pregnant women, as there are non-female identifying people who are able to become pregnant or otherwise require reproductive health care. That is the uh, medical class that's being taught by Dylan Mulvaney, apparently. To summarize, as a reporter at Politico, thanks to this style guide, you have to reject basic biology and truth in order to appease a small minority of rabid activists who should have zero business determining the editorial bent of a newspaper. Um, actually, after my book was published, and you can read the most of the style guide in the book, it's, it's in there, um, more than I even shared here. It's pretty disturbing. Um, but after the book was published, um, I still have access to the Google Doc with the style guide on it um, at Politico. I hope they're not watching. I go on there occasionally, and I discovered um, a few months after the book came out that they had actually updated the style guide again, and it had somehow become even worse to the point where it was no longer suggested to use pregnant people, but actually demanded by, uh, of reporters to use this dehumanizing language about women. I will say there are some signs that things are starting to change in the media. Earlier this year, the New York Times was accused of transphobia for publishing articles that explored the negative side effects and dark side of what the left calls gender-affirming treatment for minors, which is sex changes for minors. Mostly low-level New York Times staffers, including people who don't even work as reporters, but who work in things like graphic design or social media, things like that, um, coordinated and sending a letter to the paper's standards editor alongside a separate letter from the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, or GLAAD, that claimed the paper had irresponsible, biased coverage of transgender people. GLAAD demanded that the New York Times stop printing biased anti-trans stories, said they had to hold a meeting with transgender community members and leaders, and hire more transgender staff. But the Times did not react the way Politico did, and they didn't react the way that even they themselves did back when the left came after them for publishing an op-ed from Senator Tom Cotton about sending in the National Guard to put down riots. Instead, a spokesperson for the New York Times defended the paper's coverage. This individual explained that the Times' journalistic mission is different from the advocacy mission, advocacy mission of groups like GLAAD. Quote, as a news organization, we pursue independent reporting on transgender issues. Additionally, two editors with the paper sent an email to staff in which they warned that they would not tolerate employees siding with advocacy groups to try to sway the paper's coverage of important issues, and they also would not tolerate publicly attacking colleagues for publishing things that they disagree with. Quote, it is not unusual for outside groups to critique our coverage or to rally supporters to seek to influence our journalism. In this case, however, members of our staff and contributors to the Times joined the effort. Their protest letter included direct attacks on several of our colleagues, 
singling them out by name. We do not welcome and will not tolerate participation by Times journalists in protests organized by advocacy groups or attacks on colleagues on social media or other platforms. This rare defense of journalistic integrity from a mainstream media outlet was followed up by an open letter signed by veteran New York Times reporters pushing back on their woke colleagues. The letter read in part, factual, accurate journalism that is written, edited, and published in accordance with Times standards does not create a hostile workplace. We are journalists, not activists. That line should be clear. Now, I don't know if I quite agree with that. Um, coming from New York Times journalists, they're still pretty activisty, but at the very least, they were willing to stand up to these particular colleagues who were deliberately trying to attack them for doing actual journalism. Um, in fact, last month, GLAD was back to attacking the New York Times. Um, they wrote another article exposing a youth gender clinic for failing to provide patients with proper mental health care prior to putting them through these gender transitions. And GLAD had said that this was a biased anti-trans article and showed up at the Times headquarters to protest. And the New York Times just ignored them. They didn't do anything. To me, this suggests maybe that the adults are trying to take back control of the newsrooms. It might be, just may be possible that the left-wing media is starting to learn the lesson that campus administrators failed to learn about allowing people to get away with this mob-like behavior. Then again, it also wouldn't be any skin off my back if the media just self-immolates and they let the woke mob take over and it all destroys itself. Um, but I think there's some value in, in, the, in this country having um, a nice democratic objective media. I think that would be good. Um, but that being said, even outside of the media, nothing is going to change really until we address what's happening in our education system. If we continue to allow crazy progressive teachers to indoctrinate students, and it's starting younger and younger every year, right? They're not just in colleges anymore. These campus uh, administrators and academics and intellectuals are now the ones training your kids' elementary school teachers to go into class with critical race theory and radical gender ideology and, and inculcate those same values that they teach on college campuses now. And it's even scarier when you start younger because those kids are way more impressionable. They don't have the critical thinking skills to push back on their kindergarten or first grade teachers who are teaching them this nonsense. They're trying to take away the opportunity for parents to develop a good base of values for their kids to raise their kids in the way that they see fit, and then you send them off to college and you hope for the best, right? That's how it used to be. Um, but they're trying to get them even before that happens, before you even have the ability to do that now. Um, so if we continue to allow this, if we continue to watch as the school board members, the campus administrators, the teachers unions, um, you know, step aside as things go woke, or even worse, actively encourage it, I don't think any of our institutions really stand a chance. We have to cut it off at the root as opposed to trying to solve the problem once these kids get through the education system and start to capture institutions. Um, so I hope that you all will consider buying the book. Again, I'll sign copies. I'll also take questions. Um, but really appreciate you all coming out, and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. Thanks. And how, how is it at Georgetown now? I've heard it's uh, just as bad, if not worse, mm -hmm. for, according to students I've talked to. 70000 a year for that? Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, luckily, I, I was a low-income kid, so I uh, got a lot of financial aid. I don't think I, my parents would have. You want to do a few yeah. questions? I'd love to, yes. Okay. If you'd uh, yeah, give your name and uh, affiliation if you have one, and speak into the mic so C-SPAN can and the recording uh, can get you. Thank you for that, that was excellent. Thank you. Uh, my name's Jody Hughes. Um, I have uh, kids that are uh, 25, 22, and 21. And so um, in order to speak to them about these important things, I'm constantly looking at alternative media, alternative media. Uh, so I'm really curious about your, uh, what your take is on the future of mainstream, because my kids don't, don't do, they don't even know who's on CNN, Fox, or anything. So, um, you know, for example, like um, when um, 
the free press was made, Barry Weiss left, you know, so there's a lot of online alternative medias and I can send them that. So my question for you is, do you think mainstream media, you know, short of the changes that we're talking about, I mean, is going to even survive? It's a great question. It's kind of 50-50, I think. Um, you're exactly right. There is a huge culture of independent alternative media emerging in large part due to the internet. Um, websites are no longer dependent on advertisers being willing to purchase, you know, full page ads in a newspaper. There no, a lot of them are no longer dependent on subscriberships. Um, there's so many ways to make money as a digital media outlet that you don't have to abide by the traditional mechanisms. And so the gatekeeping of the mainstream media has really been obliterated by that. And I think that's a good thing. Um, I think people should, of course, have access to alternative means of, of getting information. And we see that cable news outlets ratings are going down with the exception of maybe like Fox primetime, but everybody else, the ratings are absolutely collapsing. Um, New York Times readership is down. Pretty much every print newspaper uh, readership is down. And um, what a lot of people don't realize, too, is that a lot of the local papers that used to sort of be like your safe space from the giant corporate media are now owned by the corporations. So, um, yeah, right. Like corporations like Gannett own a significant chunk of uh, local papers now. And so those are basically part of the mainstream media um, when I consider it at, at this point. And... I just, I don't know how they're going to survive. I mean, they have to adapt, right? They have to do something differently. And what I posit in the book is that this wokeness, this going further to the left is only accelerating what is sort of inevitable. Thank you for your question. A lighter note. Sure. I saw a woman comedian on TV, and she said that her third grade daughter was asked to decide was she, she, he, they, them, and she wrote down that she was going to pick they, them. And she said, now, why? She said, I tried to be very sensitive about why would you pick they, them to identify yourself, this little girl. And she said, well, I thought that if I picked they, them on pizza day, I could get two pieces. <laughs> So the wonderfulness of children. Right. <laughs> and as an English major, my, my teeth just grind every time I hear that. I know. Put into I know. A sentence. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. I mean, it's a great point about the kids, right, is they, they want to emulate the behavior that they see from trusted adults. And that's why what the teachers are doing is so scary. They're, they're not they – they seem to think that these kids are capable of the type of rational thought that allows them to decide who and what they are. And they're really just brainwashing them in the process. And the kids do it for attention. They do it because they think they'll be rewarded by the teacher or they just want to be like the teacher. And it's really sad um, what we see in, in so many of these stories and videos coming out of the, the schools nowadays. I'm in, I was in marriage prep, um, Catholic marriage prep, until very recently because, um, as Michelle said, I'm getting married soon. And one of the questions that our priest asked us was, where do you plan to send your kids, God willing, to school? And we were like, oh, we'll send them to St. Rita. You know, we, we don't trust, we live in Fairfax County, so like no way in heck that we're going to send them there. And he, he said, truly, he said, good, because public schools are not an option anymore. Um, I'd still like us to try to save public schools, especially when we don't have an adequate school choice system. You know, a lot of parents don't have the opportunity to send their kids to private or charter schools. But um, for him to think that they're too far gone is a really scary thing to think about. Thank you for your comments. And I agree so much with what you said. Um, I'm 87 years old, so I have 23 great grandchildren. Congratulations. My oldest great-grandson is a sophomore at Georgetown. Oh, no. And I <laughs> want to tell you his experience. Last year as a freshman, he was in the freshman dorm. 
He, this year, is living off campus with four friends because they were so persecuted as conservatives. Nasty notes under their doors. They would go down to the dorm, uh, dorm dining room to eat, and they were, they were shunned. You know you can't sit with us, um, uh, this kind of thing. It is hateful yes. what's going on. In California, fifth graders are given uh, one week of two hours for five days uh, to determine whether they want to be a boy or a girl, and it's mandated for every public school. So this is one reason I agree with this gentleman. We have got to keep our children out of the public schools in parochial, private, or homeschooling, and maybe if enough it carries across the country, enough will destroy the current public schools. But I see no hope for the public schools. I live in Fairfax County. I am supporting four very fine pe persons for the school board. Yes. And uh, unless we change it uh, and the state level, uh, I don't see a change at yep. all. And finally, I'd like to ask you to comment, and I'm sorry, Michelle, for being so wordy. Uh, I'd like you, I was very distressed yesterday. The White House counsel, not the White House press office, wrote a letter to the major networks instructing them to defend Biden and uh, on all these allegations and saying that there is no evidence. Now, this came from the White House counsel, who is the president's attorney. Right. And I have never in all my 87 years seen this is dictatorship and communism at its finest. And I am truly worried. Yes, I'd love to comment on that. It was shocking because a judge already ruled that the Biden administration had violated the First Amendment when they coordinated with social media companies to cut down on misinformation. Now, what's so ridiculous about this is that they are the worst purveyors of misinformation, right? They are the people who advanced the Russian collusion hoax. They're the people who uh, insisted that the P-tape was real against Donald Trump. They're the people who shut down the Hunter Biden laptop story and banned the New York Post for reporting on it. Um, they were the people who advanced the false Alpha Bank story. They, CNN published that Anthony Scaramucci was under investigation by the FBI when he wasn't. The list goes on and on. I mean, and also there are people who say, you know, men can be women and all of this crazy stuff. But then they think that they get the right to determine for Americans what content they see because they deem it misinformation. It's a politicized way of shutting down the opposition. And so for the White House counsel to turn around and do that after they've already been found to be in violation of the First Amendment is horrific. And I'm sure someone is bringing suit. I don't know who's going to do it, but I know on the conservative side, someone will to try to hold them accountable. You're right. It's beyond disturbing. On the Georgetown point, I experienced the same thing as your grandson. My freshman year, I got so many nasty notes on my door. So my entire freshman year floor were all Obama supporters. This was during the 2012 election. And I saw all these Obama signs and I thought, I'm going to put up a Romney sign just so people, you know, see the other side. And I wasn't even a huge Romney supporter. I just, it seemed like the right thing to do. So I put up the sign and people would come by every day and they would write the nastiest things on it. I mean, just graphic depictions of genitalia and curse words. And sometimes people would run by my door and knock on it and yell something nasty and then run down the hallway. It was like fifth grade bullying, truly. I mean, the most immature stuff, but the worst, um, one of the worst incidents was I was trying to start a gun safety club on campus and I had a sign up on my door. It had a little AR-15 on it and, you know, send emails to this address if you're interested in joining the club. And somebody on the floor reported me to the RA saying that I was making them feel unsafe with the depiction of the gun. And the RA asked if I could take it down. And I was like, what? I'm not doing that. So I went around the whole dorm and I took pictures of all of the other um, horrible signs on people's doors, whether you know it was male genitalia, curse words. Amazingly, there was actually a cartoon drawing of the RA in a compromising position. And so I took a picture of that. I put it all in an email. And I sent it to him and I said, I find these, you know, whiteboards extremely offensive. And I think, you know, before you violate my speech rights, you're going to have to tell every all of these other people to take down their 
content as well. And he just replied, touche. <laughs> and I never heard another word about it. So <laughs> so I hope your, your grandson is doing well. I hope he continues to stand up for himself. Good. Yeah. Yeah, and conservatives need to stand up for each other. Um, courage is contagious. When one person stands up for themselves and does the brave thing, other people will follow. Now, you're not going to get everybody, but it does make a difference to see that there are people supporting you, that there are organizations supporting you. It makes a huge, huge difference. Thank you for your um, comments. I so appreciate uh, Elena Melkert, Oil and Gas Global Network. Would you comment on the role of podcasting? It's you know quite pervasive. I just you comment on the role, please, of it in this national dialogue about things. Yeah, I mean, podcasts are essentially an additional media source at this point. Um, a lot of them, I think the popular ones are more commentary than news based, but they usually lead with the news and then go into their commentary. And I think it's allowed people to get an alternative perspective. Um, I mean, the Joe Rogan podcast is the most popular podcast in, if not the world, definitely the country. And he approaches issues from a very independent stance. I mean, he's conservative on some things. He's more liberal on others. And I think it's important for people to see that, um, you know, someone can hold positions that don't neatly fit into a political box because our society has gotten so tribal all the time. We're not really interested in using our critical thinking skills at arriving at a conclusion. We just say, well, what's my side saying? What's my team saying about this? And I think we'd all be a little bit better off if we learn to uh, go through the facts of an issue or analyze it first before we just jump on whatever we think our side is saying. So I, I like I don't listen to podcasts personally. I'm not a huge podcast person, but I will occasionally listen to segments um, that I think have interesting guests, and I think they're great, and I, I'm glad to see that young people are interested in them. I actually um, have started recently guest hosting a show on Fridays um, at The Hill called Rising, and the whole point of the show is that they have a conservative and a liberal on together. Um, really more, it's, it's sort of like populist right, populist left crossover, and so every Friday I get to go on the show and talk about issues and find common ground and also debate with someone who was on the polar opposite side of the political spectrum. And we just don't have those conversations much anymore. So it's a, it's a huge blessing to be able to do that. Um, hello. Um, I like your comments on whether you think this is coming from the top down because I, I tend to think that I speak up at the school boards and I think we can use our voice to speak up, but here's my comment. I stated, any government that attempts to use an upset's father's pain over his daughter's sexual assault and victimization for a narrative of supremacy and domestic terrorism needs to look in the mirror. And for them to target parents that quickly, it seems like this is coming from the top down and not like just these people being indoctrinated. So I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it goes both ways, um, especially in the higher education sphere. These um, professors and academics really use the campuses as sort of a, a test tube for their crazy ideas. And they use the students as their guinea pigs. And so they come up with these really radical, untested theories. And then they start passing them down to their loyal followers. Um, but what happens eventually is that the loyal followers get crazier than, than the professor. And they start to eat their own. And we see the left do this all the time, where they are constantly trying to prove like who is the most woke or who is the most progressive. And so I think it's sort of a feedback loop in on campus. Um, but on the, the lower levels in, in elementary, middle, and high school, I think it absolutely is a top-down effort. I mean, these kids, they're too young, right, to really be involved. They're, they're more passive recipients of what's happening to them. And the case that you cited about um, Scott Smith, right, in Loudoun County, um, Governor Youngkin just pardoned him, which is um, – amazing justice to see. But there's still a lot of people left in that case that I think need to be held accountable. Scott Ziegler is going on trial September 25th. He was the superintendent there who lied about the sexual assault, claimed he didn't know anything about it. 
there's an email that he sent that says he knew about the incident. Um, Uda Bibberai, uh, yep, she's the, um, the the county attorney there who prosecuted Mr. Smith and has meanwhile let off or had reduced sentences for actual violent criminals. She's up for re-election this fall. And then also Attorney General Merrick Garland, who got that letter from the National School Boards Association that used Scott Smith's case as an example of domestic terrorism to create threat tags to track school board parents and uh, and released his own memo claiming that there was a, a alarming rise of violence among parents who were trying merely to protect their kids and their kids' right to receive a good education. That is one of the most horrific cases that I've ever heard of. I just wrote about it recently at The Spectator because it's so disturbing. And seeing the way that parents in Virginia rose up in the 2021 gubernatorial election gives me so much hope. I mean, to me, that is the type of grassroots activism that is going to save this country. Absolutely. Thank you for your work on, on that. It's incredible. If I could ask the last question, and then we'll eat lunch and I'll talk informally. But when you said struggle session, <laughs> I, I had not heard that term until I was reading this past week at the beach, Stella Morito's book, The uh, Morbido, her, The Weaponization of Loneliness. She was a speaker here at CWN, uh, and she was actually taped by C-SPAN also. And she talked about it how the Marxists use struggle sessions for public humiliation and yes. physical beating and really horrible stuff. Can you comment on that, the, you know, the Marxist context of that? They actually call it a struggle session. Yes, it's, um, it's like an emotional flogging. I mean, it's meant to beat you down and then build you back up with their ideas. It's a really fundamental component of these authoritarian ideas. I mean, um, if you've ever read 1984 by George Orwell, you know that they use this, the same tactic to strip people of their identity, strip people of their ideas, and turn them into empty vessels that would just accept what was being fed into them. It's a, a way of, of making people who do have critical thinking skills, older people, more conducive to brainwashing and indoctrination. Well, this is what Politico and other left-wing publications do to their employees who don't toe the line. Exactly. Because we, I mean, I think most people have a general moral compass that tells them to be kind to their fellow man and to treat each other with respect. And the woke left has no interest in that. They, they view people as tools for accumulating power. They view them as potential fellow activists, um, basically just stepping stones to get to, to where they want to be, which is wielding absolute control over everyone else. Um, there's no, I think one of the biggest problems is I mentioned the fact that journalists in particular are, are far less religious than the average American. And I see um, this trend in society where we don't approach humanity as everyone's a child of God, right? Like we're all made in the image of God. Um, we don't see people as being inherently valuable Instead, we view human relationships as very transactional. Um, and, and that's helped encourage, I think, this type of communist Marxist left um, in the way that they view society and, and how they can use people for their, their own ends. Thank you. I have, I have some gifts for you here. Oh, thank you so much. You can see why we love this young lady oh, and we thank you. promote her in any way we can. What a great talk. What a great book. What a great career, too. Thank you. And you're getting married. I know. That's the best Good part. News. <laughs> Good news. I can recommend it. I have to tell you, today is my 49th wedding anniversary. <laughs> a lot of years. <laughs> I want to give you our limited edition Claire Booth Ooh. Loose mug with her special saying, Claire Booth Loose, this is so good for you. That is beautiful. It says, courage is the ladder on which all the other virtues mount. There you yeah, go. That's You're lovely. a courageous lady. Thank you so and much. And I want to give you my book, which is about raising conservative daughters. And it's my first and only book because it took me 30 years to write it. <laughs> all of my years here at the center. And uh, I just uh, uh, wish you 
many wonderful daughters and sons. Thank you. I know. I hope I get to make good use of it. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you care. again.